Shalom family. Good to see everybody here. Shalom, shalom. Okay, we got another great one from Brother L. You know, he really did enjoy the live stream we did together. And, you know, I look forward to occasionally inviting him back again. You know, I'm just grateful he could make time for us, you know. So I think a good time was had by all him being here. I definitely enjoyed the lesson he gave. So we're going to go ahead and get started for everybody that's here. Shalom. And I hope you're all doing well. Boy, things are changing rapidly, but it's a welcome change for those of us that have been oppressed all this time. <laughs> you know, change must happen. It must happen. All right. Let me go ahead and share my screen. All right. Shalom family. Yeah, Loretta's here. Just being a little attention whore. <laughs> hey, girl. You look like you just woke up. I think you just did. Sure look like it. All right. Let's go ahead and get started, y'all. Okay. All esteem to the Most High Elohim, all praise to the Ancient of Days. This is your brother L. In this discussion right here, what I want to do is dispel some of the false notions in regards to the half truth of the doctrine of we are all the human race. We've all heard this doctrine since we were young children. Whether you were in the public school system, private school system, homeschooled, whatever the case may be. We've all heard that doctrine that people speak whenever they say we are all the human race. And I want to tackle this notion today and explore some of the truths and half truths of that statement. And I want to speak about how that statement has been used in order to put people under a delusion and to make people go into a sleepwalking state to think that this world that we live in is not as wicked as it is, as sinister as it is. And there's not things going on behind the scenes that affect what is presented to us in our face. So let's deal with this notion of we are all the human race. Because it's interesting, whenever you bring up topics such as the misappropriation of resources, such as the oppressions of certain peoples, such as the atrocities done throughout history, or whenever you begin to highlight some of the wickedness of particular groups, tribes, and races of people, what will take place is people will use as a deflection tactic the statement, we're all the human race. All races have done wickedness. All humankind suffers. All humans have been enslaved. All humans have been murdered. All humans have done wickedness to other humans. And they use that as a broad, general, painted brush to try to get you to not continue to speak on whatever it is that you're bringing light to of the wickedness that other nations and peoples have done or the atrocities that other nations and peoples have done. Particularly when you bring up the atrocities that have been done to the melanated peoples all over the earth, immediately what people will do is deflect and say, we're all the human race. We're all one people. What's interesting though, is that whenever they make that statement of we're all the human race, there's just one race and that's the human race. What they never speak of is that there's another type of race that's going on. It's the race for power. It's the race for resources. It's the race to set the rules and the laws. It's the race for superiority and dominance over the earth. They'll tell you we're all the human race, but they never talk about the race for 
the number one position. They never talk about the race of groups and peoples and tribes who are in a literal race to the top, to be the dominant, to be the superior. So we need to look at this in the form that it really truly needs to be looked at. We need to talk about the race of the races. That's the phrase we're going to use for this, the race of the races. And what we're speaking about is the marathon. What we're speaking about is how all these different groups and tribes of people are jockeying for power. All these different tribes and groups of people, quote unquote, races of people, how they are doing what it is they need to do to set them and their people up to be the dominant ones in the future. All the while that they're giving us this doctrine that we're all the human race, we're all together, we're all one people. Behind the scenes of that, you got all these different races of people jockeying for power to make their race the supreme race above all races. Let's talk about this for a moment. The race of the races. First, we need to understand where this whole doctrine of race even comes from. And in order to speak about that, we got to talk about this dude called Johann Friedrich Blumenbach. 1752 and died in 1840. This dude was a prominent German anatomist and early anthropologist. And he had a dissertation called On the Unity of Mankind that was written in 1795 that's still recognized for the scientific approach that it took to the study of human variation and the starting point of anthropology. This was a German dude. Before him, in the ancient world, what we understood as what they call races was simply tribes, clans, families, and nations. Especially when you look at scripture, it divides mankind up into families, clans, tribes, and nations. In the ancient world, they didn't look at things through the lens of race. They looked at things through the lens of genealogy, of tribe, of clan, of family, of nation. It wasn't until this dude, Friedrich Blumenbach, that they started speaking about races and having these new classifications of races. Now, what ended up taking place was this dude started being an influential teacher and researcher. He had a publication called the Textbook of Comparative Anatomy. And at that time, what he did was develop certain ideas about life on Earth, um, recognition of fossil species and things of that nature. This dude believed that the earth and all the plants and animals had an ancient history. And that idea led him to a geological paleontological timeline that he devised based on those ideas. And he began to present certain concepts about humanity and nature and the protocols and techniques needed for scientific research to study those phenomena. Now, what we have to understand about the time that this dude Blumenbach was putting forth a lot of his studies. This was at a time when they were using false scientific findings and developing these false constructs of race to make it seem like the melanated peoples of the earth were the inferior. Like for instance, one of the first classifications of mankind, it was made by this dude, Carl Linnaeus, 1707 to 1778. He was the father of taxonomy and in this book he wrote called Systema Natura, he followed both continental geography and a color scheme, check this out, that divided mankind into white European, dark Asiatic, red American, and black Negro. So in his time, many of these characters that he divided everybody up into, that he used to classify the races, it was very subjective and it was unscientific. At that time, they labeled the Europeans as hopeful, the Asiatics as sad and rigid, the American natives as irascible, and the Africans as calm and lazy. That was their whole basis of classification. 
and also around that time that Blumenbach was putting forth his research, in 1749, there was another French naturalist named Georges Buffon, 1707-1788, and he also formulated a classification scheme to distinguish between types of humans. He envisioned six different varieties, which was the Laps, the Tartars, the Mongolians, the European, the American, the South Asian, the Ethiopian divisions. And that's how he divided up the races. Another attempt to classify the races was uh, this dude named Maynard in 1793. And how he divided up all the nations, he divided it into two different stocks of people, which he called the handsome white people, including the Celts, Sarmatians, and Oriental nations, and the ugly dark peoples, which consisted of all the rest. So these was the type of research, these was the type of articles that was being written in the time that Friedrich Blumenbach came forth with his, with his book, The One Unity of Mankind, where he divided humanity into different type of races, and they have run with his research to this day in how they separate the races of the people. Now, what we need to do is go to scripture, because we know that Friedrich Blumenbach is not our foremost scholar on how we need to view humanity and the divisions of humanity. So what we got to do is go to Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 7 through 9, and let's see what the Most High has to say about these things. Here's what it says in Deuteronomy 32, 7 through 9. It says, remember the days of old. Consider the years of many generations. Ask thy father and he will show thee, thy elders and they will tell thee. When the Most High divided to the nations their inheritance, when he separated the sons of Adam, he set the bounds of the people according to the number of the children of Israel. For the Most High's portion is his people and Jacob is the lot of his inheritance. So here it says that the Most High separated the sons of Adam, set the bounds of the people. He divided to the nations their inheritance, but that Jacob, but that Israel was the lot of his inheritance and his portion. So when we're talking about the race of the races, what we're speaking of from the scriptural standpoint is that the Most High divided the nations their inheritances. It also talks about this in the book of Jubilees, whenever Shem, Ham, and Japheth cast lots. They cast lots to divide the earth and the land and the lineage of each different son. Their inheritance was to certain lands. You can read about this in Jubilees chapter 9 and chapter 10. We won't go into that now, but I just need to touch on this so that we know from a scriptural standpoint that the children of Israel, the people of Jacob, is the lot of the Most High's inheritance. Now, let's revisit this notion where they talk about that we are all the human race. And let's expose that that is a half truth. It's not a total truth. Let's go to what scriptures have to say about that. Let's go to Acts chapter 17, starting at verse 24. Listen to what it says. The Most High that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is the Elohim of heaven and earth, dwelling not in temples made with hands, neither is worshipped with men's hands, as though he needed anything, seeing he giveth to all life and breath and all things, and hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on the face of the earth, and hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation that they should seek the Most High, if happily they might feel after him and find him, though he be not far from every one of us. So the scripture indeed does say that all mankind is made of one blood. That is true. We are all made of one blood. But snakes, sharks, spiders, all these creatures that will bite you and kill you, and have poison that will take you out after one bite, all of these creatures have the same blood as well. They also have blood. A wildebeest also has blood. But does that mean that you and I are equal to a wildebeest 
or did the father give us dominion over the wildebeest? Follow me on this. A snake has blood, but did the father give us dominion over the snake or are we equal to the snake, even though we all have the same blood? So yes, all creatures that the most high has created, we all have one blood, but a hyena is not equal to a man. A snake is not equal to a man. A shark is not equal to a man, even though we all have one blood. Now, let's continue forward. Let's go to the book of Revelation real quick. Let's go to Revelation chapter 7, verse 9. It says, After this I beheld, and lo, a great multitude, which no man could number, of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues, stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hands, and cried with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our Elohim, which sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb. So there we see that people of all nations, tribes, tongues, are around the throne of the Most High, praising the Most High. Hallelujah. So that's a beautiful thing, that people from all those different nations that are of the one blood are around the throne praising the Most High. That's beautiful. Yet, there's still some things that we need to keep in our mind as it pertains to the race of the races. Let's shoot back over to Deuteronomy. Let's shoot back over to Deuteronomy chapter 32, starting at verse 21. Listen to what it says. They have moved me to jealousy with that which is not an Elohim. They have provoked me to anger with their vanities, and I will move them to jealousy with those which are not a people. I will provoke them to anger with a foolish nation. Right here, the Most High is talking about whenever his people rebelled against him, that there would be a lesser people, a people who are lesser than them, that would provoke them to jealousy, a people which are not a people, a people that would have them subjugated, a people that in the race of the races would get to the resources and the power before them for a certain period of time. Now, what we have to understand as it pertains to the race of the races, many times they try to tell us this doctrine of we're all the human race as a smokescreen that they use while they take the resources, the power, and the authority. That is only a half truth. It is only a half truth that we are all the human race as it pertains to those who seek the most high keep the Most High's laws and commands and are grafted in to the Most High through his people. Because what does it tell us in Leviticus chapter 24, starting at verse 22? It says, ye shall have one manner of law as well for the stranger as for one of your own country. So the scripture teaches us righteous judgment that there is one law, meaning to the Hebrew and to the Gentile. But we are only dealt with as one people as it pertains to us keeping that one law because there could not be no one among us not keeping that law because then they would be cast out from us. So we are only one people as it pertains to us keeping that one law, which is the highest law of the universe, the laws of the creator, the laws of the most high, Torah. Because all these people that go around saying we're all the human race, we're all one people, the question that they need to answer is what is the universal constitution of the human race? What is the law of the human race? Since we're all the human race, what law are we under? Since we're all the human race, what rules are we supposed to follow? Because they'll tell you we're all one people, we're all the human race, well, how come when I fly over to Dubai, the law is different than when I fly over to the Netherlands? What's illegal in Dubai is legal in the Netherlands. And then if I fly from the Netherlands over to Australia, what was illegal in the Netherlands is now legal in Australia. Then when I fly from Australia to Canada, what's illegal in Australia is legal in Canada. Then when I fly from Canada to Mexico, 
that was illegal in Canada is legal in Mexico. If we're all one human race, how come I can get locked up for doing something in Australia that they say it's fine to do in Mexico if we're all one human race? If we're all one human race, how come there's not one law of all humanity? Where is that universal constitution? Don't tell me it's the United Nations because <laughs> everybody rebels against the United Nations rules that they set up and they get no punishments for it. So what is the one law of humanity since we're all the human race? That's the question that we need to ask. Well, the Most High has one law and he only says that those who are a people are those who keep that law, whether they be Hebrew or whether they be Gentile. Other than that, they're castaways. But let me show you here how time and time again, they use that doctrine of we are all one human race to subjugate and oppress. Let's go to the book of 1 Maccabees, chapter 41. Let's read about the time that the Greeks were in Jerusalem and what they were doing to subjugate the people. And let's see what was the first lie that they told in order to put the people under oppression. It says, then the king wrote to his whole kingdom that they should all become one people and everyone should give up his particular practices. And all the heathen assented to the command and many from Israel agreed to his kind of worship and offered sacrifice to idols and broke the Sabbath. So this king, the lie that he told the masses was, we're all one people. That's the lie that he told them in order to subjugate and to oppress. The same lie that they're telling us, we're all one human race. We're all one people. That's only half true. We are all only one people as long as we keep the one law of the creator of the universe, which is Torah. Other than that, we are not one people. Other than that, we are not one human race. Only those who are under that law of the Most High are one. And even at that, the Most High has hierarchy and classification. As it is written in Romans chapter 1, starting at verse 16, it says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Hamashiach, for it is the power of the Most High unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. So what the scripture is saying here is that there is a righteous hierarchy that as it pertains to those who are under that one law of the creator of the universe, it's to the Hebrew first, then to the Gentile. Just like whenever the Most High created Adam, humanity and man was created out of the same dust of the earth as the animals and with the same blood as the animals. Yet, even though animals and men were both formed from the earth, Adam, the man, was given authority over the animals. Even though we were both formed from the same dirt and have the same blood. So as it pertains to humanity and all the different races of people, even though we all came from the loins of uh, Adam and the womb of Eve, guess what? There's still a people that has dominion over the other people, just like Adam had dominion over the beast and the creatures. Why do you think that throughout scripture, whenever it's prophesying about nations and peoples, it always uh, uses the metaphor of animals? Whenever you read the book of Enoch, Daniel, Isaiah, even in Revelation, all the nations that are prophesied about, the metaphor that is used is beasts and animals of the field. And we know that the scriptures were written to our people for our edification. Yes, we are the light of the world. The scriptures were first given to Israel for us to teach the nations. This is why whenever Peter had his vision of all the animals, the father used that vision of the animals to show Peter that you as a Hebrew are to teach to these other nations as well and have dominion because just like it's written in Torah, it's one law for the Hebrew and for the Gentile. But still, just like Adam had dominion over the beast, 
you, the children of Israel, have dominion over all the nations. Are you starting to see the correct way that this lines up? So whenever they say we are all one human race, that's only half true. Because even though we all have the same blood formed from the same dirt, just like Adam was destined to rule over the animals, the children of Israel in this race of the races, we are destined for first place. Even though it looks like we're in last right now, the last shall be first. In this race of the races, we are destined to be first and have dominion over the other nations, just like Adam had dominion over the beast. Even though Adam was formed from the same dirt and had the same blood as the beast that he was destined to rule over. Are you starting to see this? Hallelujah. And isn't it interesting that the scripture says that a righteous man will even treat his beast well. Think about that whenever the father talks about us being in power, that we are not to be unrighteous judges, even dealing with the heathen. The scripture says that those who judge and stand as leaders among the people, we must not have unrighteous judgment. Let's go to those scriptures. Exodus chapter 22, starting at verse 21. It says, thou shalt neither vex a stranger nor oppress him, for you were strangers in the land of Egypt. Let's think about this for a moment. The scripture even tells us that we must treat animals righteously, that we will even be judged for how we deal with animals. Now, that doesn't mean if a lion is charging at you to kill you that you don't kill that lion. That doesn't mean that we can't go out and hunt for our food. Whenever it's talking about dealing with the animals in righteousness, we must not do those things we see the heathen doing right now, poisoning the oceans, trying to conduct all these unrighteous experiments on the animals with transhumanism and uh, bestiality and all these wicked things that the heathen do to sin against the animals. We talked about this the, the other day, Brother Patrick and myself. So we're not to be unrighteous towards the animals. Now think about this as it pertains to how the father compares the heathen nations to beast. We also, as rulers having dominion over the beast, must rule righteously. Even when we're dealing with beast and animals, we defend ourselves against them, but we must still have righteous judgment. Hallelujah. And this is difficult for many brothers and sisters to do, to have righteous judgment, even as it pertains to the heathen and these other nations, knowing the history of what they've done. But if there is someone that is a Gentile that is truly keeping the laws and commands, acknowledging the true people of the Most High and clinging on to salvation through the chosen people of the Most High, like it talks about in the book of Hosea, that they will cling on to the fringes of a Hebrew and say, please let us come with you. Or like it says in Isaiah chapter 14, verse 1 and 2, that those of the heathen will become possessions of the children of Israel and cling on to them. Let's go to that scripture real quick. Isaiah chapter 14, verse 1 and 2. Because what we need to do is set righteous order in this. It says, for the Most High will have mercy on Jacob and will yet choose Israel and set them in their own land. And the strangers shall be joined with them and they shall cleave to the house of Jacob. And the people shall take them and bring them to their place. And the house of Israel shall possess them in the land of the Most High for servants and handmaids. And they shall take them captives whose captives they were and they shall rule over their oppressors. Hallelujah. So think about whenever brothers have uh, pets, right? They got the dog. They keep it on that leash, right? They got the pit bull. They got the Rottweiler. They keep it on that leash. They don't treat that dog uh, cruel with cruelty because that's your dog. That's your pet. That's your servant in a sense. And the scripture here is comparing the nations that we will possess as that. Righteous servants, handmaids. In the laws and commands of Torah, it even says that whenever a donkey falls into a ditch, we must help that donkey out. Even if that donkey belongs to somebody we hate, an enemy, that we must not allow that donkey to stay stuck in that ditch, to pull it out. 
The scripture even says, do not muzzle the ox whenever it treads the corn. We had to feed our animals correctly. We had to take care of the animals correctly. There were even laws against the mistreatment of animals that if an animal fell into a pit or if an animal was unrighteously killed, that that animal had to be dealt with in a certain way. Same thing the father is telling us here as it pertains to us having a dominion mindset. And it's interesting whenever you look at how the Gentiles have turned this understanding around. They say that we are the animals. They say that we are the subhumans. They say that we are the ones that need to be domesticated and treated like stock and cattle and chattel, like in chattel slavery. But it's the quite opposite. In scripture, it says that they are the ones that are to be herded and ruled over. They are the ones that we have dominion over. And even though we have dominion, we must deal with them in righteousness, just like you would deal with your ox or your donkey in righteousness, according to the laws and commands of Torah. But let it never be misunderstood who is superior and who is subservient. Let that never be misunderstood. And whenever you look at history, as it pertains to the race of the races, they have tried to hold themselves up as the superior ones, all the while telling us we are one people, we are one human race. They have tried to subjugate us and put us to the bottom when we are the ones that are destined to be on top, like Adam. Because through our Messiah, who is called the second Adam, he gave us power. Like he says in Revelation chapter 2 and 3, to those who overcome, I will give you an iron rod and you shall do what? Rule over all nations with that iron rod. You shall overcome just as I overcame. Hallelujah. This is the race of the races. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 12, starting at verse 1. In this race of the races, we will win, but we need to first understand that this is, this is indeed a race. This is indeed a marathon. This is indeed competition. This is indeed warfare. So we can't become delusion whenever they throw that little cliche phrase out there that we're all one human race. Whenever they say that, we need to turn right back and say, and humanity is in a race against one another. There is a race for resources. There is a race for dominance and power. That's why China and Russia is in Africa right now, because they are in a race for the resources of that land. That's why nations are stockpiling nuclear weapons, because they're in a race for that power. So don't come to me with all that we all are one human race thing when you don't even have one law for all of the human race. You don't even have one common law. And whenever we look to scriptures, we see that when all humanity was united under Nimrod, it didn't even work then. It did not even work then. We've tried this experiment of there being one people, one world, one nation, all the human race. They tried it in Babylon and it didn't work. It's not going to work again. It's just not. What it's going to be is either you bow down to the supremacy of the Most High and the Hebrews and the law of the Most High's people. You repent, be baptized, keep the commands, because we all got to do that whether we're Hebrew or Gentile. We all got to bow down to the Most High. The scripture says every knee shall bow, every tongue confess. So guess what? Whether you Hebrew or Gentile, we're all servants of the Most High. We're all going to bow down to the Most High. But after that, the Gentiles going to bow to the Hebrew. This is the correct teaching in Scripture. We all have the same blood. We're all formed from the same dirt. We're all going to bow the knee and confess with the tongue that the Most High and Yeshua Hamashiach are sovereign and king, but the Gentiles going to bow to the Hebrew. That's the hierarchy of this. Hallelujah. But what we need to understand is that there's a race that our people must run. And there's a race that us as individuals must run. So we need to go over some scriptures that will give us motivation to run this race, this race of the races, so that we individually come out on top 
and we as a people come out on top. As it says in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1, it says, Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Notice that this verse about our people running a race to win, to endure to the end, this is in a book called Hebrews. Notice it's not written in a book called European. Notice it's not written in a book called Chinese. Notice it's not written in a book called whatever. It's written in a book called Hebrews. It's not even written in a book called Jewish. It's written in a book called Hebrews. So in the book of Hebrews, the Most High is telling the Hebrews, you need to run this race. And you need to run this race thinking about your ancestors. That's that cloud of witnesses. The cloud of witnesses is the ancestors who went before us who have already ran their race. They've already won their championship. They're waiting on us at the finish line. They're waving the flag of the kingdom of the Most High at the finish line, telling us to keep going. All the ancestors, the martyrs, the ones that they lynched, the ones that they burned, the ones who died, the disciples who were thrown in prison and martyred for this truth, they are at the finish line telling us keep going. They are at the finish line screaming down to us, don't stop. They are at the finish line screaming down to us, endure telling us, run that race with patience. As the scripture says, this is the faith and patience of the saints. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of our ancestors. You got all these conscious, pro-black, comedic people talking about ancestors, ancestors, ancestors. We need to speak about our ancestors, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, we need to speak about our ancestors, Deborah, Judith, Miriam. We need to speak about our ancestors, Judah Maccabees, Jonathan, David. We need to speak about our ancestors, Enoch, Elijah, Elisha. We need to speak about our ancestors, James, John, Bartholomew. We need to speak about our ancestors, the angelic ones in the heavenlies that are with us on this race, telling us to go, telling us to run telling us to win. They are like our trainers and our coaches preaching to us through the pages of the scripture, preaching to us through the Holy Spirit that prays on behalf of us and groans unexpressible, telling us to run this race to win. We are spiritual Olympians. Think about the Olympics. They have all these different nations and races and countries who represent their flag and represent their people. But only one nation can win the gold. Only one nation can dominate. Only one nation can stand on the platform as the winner, as the number one. Well, guess what, family? We are in the spiritual Olympics, the race of the races. And we must be that people that come forth as pure gold to receive that gold crown. Hallelujah. Because what does it say in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 24 through 27? Know ye not that they which run in a race all run, but one receiveth the prize. So run that ye may obtain. And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. I therefore so run, not as uncertainly, so I fight, not as one that beats the air, but I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means, when I have preached to others, I myself should become a castaway. So Paul was saying, if I don't endure, and if I don't make it to the end of this race and win first place, not second or third, I am a castaway, meaning I am just fuel for the fire. I am subhuman. I am unhuman if I don't win this race. Because if I don't win this race, I will not be a part of that people that the Father claims to be his own when he tells us in Scripture that it will be said to those that they said, you are not my people, that you are my people. It will be said to those who they said, you are monkeys, you are animals, you are uh, subhuman. It will be said to those same people, you are the royalty, you are the majesty, 
You are the rulers of the kingdom of the most high. You are supremacy. You are power. Hallelujah. But in order for that to be the result, we must endure. We must run this race, this race of the races, this race of all races, the race for salvation, the race for power, the race for supremacy, the race to make it to the kingdom, the race to win in this life and the life to come, the race to have first place in the resurrection, as it talks about in the book of Second Ezra. Hallelujah. We must have that same spirit and power as we run this race of the races that's written about the Most High's army in the book of Joel, chapter 2, verse 1 through 19. What does it say? Blow ye the trumpet in Zion and sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble for the day of the Most High cometh, for it is nigh at hand, a day of darkness and of gloominess a day of clouds and a thick darkness as the morning spread upon the mountains a great people and a strong there hath not been ever the like neither shall there be any more after it even to the years of many generations a fire devoureth before them and behind them a flame burneth the land is as the garden of eden before them and behind them a desolate wilderness yea and nothing shall escape them the appearance of them is as the appearance of horses, and as horsemen, so shall they run. We must be this people, family, that are like horsemen that run on this race of the races. It says, like the noise of chariots on the tops of mountains shall they leap, like the noise of a flame of fire that devoureth the stubble, a strong people set in battle array. Before their face the people shall be much pain, all faces shall gather blackness. They shall run like mighty men. Let me read this again, because this is how we, the people of the Most High, must run on this race to eternal life, on this race for world domination. We must run this race like mighty men, the race of the races. They shall run like mighty men. They shall climb the wall like men of war, and they shall march every one his way, and they shall not break their rank. Neither one shall thrust another. They shall walk every one in his path. This means that this is a people that is moving in unison, not against each other, but for each other. This is the race of the races. And when they fall upon the sword, they shall not be wounded. Let me tell you, all these other races are in this race of the races. There was a story recently about some sisters, two Hebrew sisters that started a business selling hair, uh, you know, cosmetics, beauty products. And in that industry, we know that the Asians, primarily the Koreans, Filipinos, they run that industry. And they would not sell wholesale to these sisters. They would not give them the inventory they needed to run their business because the Asians said, you are not our people. So we are not going to front you the consignment. We're not going to give you the inventory and the stock that you need to run your business. So the sisters went out of business. Why? Because all these other nations understand that they are in a race of the races and they have a mind to help their own people because they understand they are in a racial war. They understand they are in a racial Olympics. So they want their, they are vying for their people to have the power, the prominence and the dominance. So to the point where they will not do business with those who are not their people. They are in a race of the races. And this army right here of the Most High's people, it says they do not fight against one another. They do not break rank. So they become that powerful force in the race of the races. Let's continue to read. It says, they shall run to and fro in the city. They shall run upon the wall. They shall climb up upon the houses. They shall enter in at the windows like a thief. This sounds a lot like in the book of Jasher, chapter 39, when the sons of Jacob was going to war against the Sechemites. It says that they was leaping on the walls. They was jumping over bridges. They was running faster than Usain Bolt. They was running faster than the, the prophet Elijah when he outran Ahab's chariot. They was running faster than the disciple Philip whenever he transported after he baptized the Ethiopian. This is talking about our people having supernatural endowment supernatural power so that we can dominate and win this race of the races. There's a video that went viral a few years ago of a marathon race. And there was a Caucasian woman. 
that she thought she had won the race. She was right there about 10 feet from the finish line. But all of a sudden, there was a melanated sister that breezed right past her. And at the last split second, she won that race. But the Caucasian woman, even before she got to the finish line, she was celebrating. She was smiling. She had her hands in the air as if she was already promised to win the gold and win the race. But she got bested. She got beat by a melanated sister, a Hebrew sister. And that's the same thing that's going on right now in this race of the races. Our enemies are celebrating over us. Our adversaries are thinking that they've already but won this race. They're smiling over our dead bodies. They're laughing at our oppression, thinking that they've already crossed the finish line. But we are going to be like that sister that burst forth in the last few seconds of that race to get the championship and be the dominant superior people and win this race of the races in these last days. Hallelujah. I feel this in my soul. Listen to what the scripture says next. The earth shall quake before them. The heavens shall tremble, the sun and the moon shall be dark, and the stars shall withdraw their shining. And the Most High shall utter his voice before his army, for his camp is very great, for he is strong that executeth his word. For the day of the Most High is great and very terrible. Who can abide it? All praise to the Most High of Israel. All praise. Here's the thing, though. In order for us to run this race of the races, there's things that we must do. Just like that Olympic runner must train. Every day they must be out there running on the track, lifting the weights. But in our race for salvation, we must set aside the weight that so easily besets us. Set aside the wicked habits. Set aside the gossiping and the slander. Set aside the hating your brother in your heart. Set aside being a drunkard. Set aside being an adulterer, a fornicator. Set aside being a Sabbath breaker. Set aside being a man who abandons your family. Set aside being a woman that aborts your children. Set aside being out here selling dope to your own people. Set aside being a liar. Set aside being a witch and a sorcerer. Set aside these things. These are weights that make you not able to run as fast as you would normally. Listen to what the scripture says is expected of us. It says, therefore also now saith the most high, Turn ye even to me with all your heart. So we must turn to the Most High with all our heart in order to win this race of the races. Turn ye even to me with all your heart and with fasting and with weeping and with mourning and rend your heart, not your garments, and turn unto the Most High your Elohim. For he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness and repenteth him of the evil. Who knoweth if he will return and repent and leave a blessing behind him even a meat offering and a drink offering unto the Most High. Blow the trumpet in Zion, sanctify a fast, call a solemn assembly, gather the people, sanctify the congregation, assemble the elders, gather the children and those that suck the breast. Let the bridegroom go forth of his chamber and the bride out of her closet. Let the priests, the ministers of the Most High, weep between the porch and the altar and let them say, spare thy people. Most high and give not thine heritage to reproach that the heathen should rule over them. Hallelujah. So right here, the prophet Joel is praying to the most high. Father, make us as your army. And in this race of the races, do not let the heathen rule over us. It's right here in the scripture. And this is the same mentality we must have. That in this race of the races, we must not let these heathens rule over us. At your workplace. You must dominate the heathens at your workplace. Whatever craft you do, whether it's art, whether it's music, whether it's teaching, whether it's sports, whatever is your craft, your occupation, do not let these heathens rule over you. Perfect your craft, perfect your talent, manifest Hebrew excellence on your job, manifest Hebrew excellence in your family, manifest Hebrew excellence at your business, Manifest Hebrew excellence at your ministry. Everywhere you go, manifest Hebrew excellence so that we do not let these heathens rule over us. Not now and definitely not in the kingdom. This is the race of the races. Hallelujah. But in order for us to get that supernatural power endowed upon us, the scripture here says that we must repent. We must 
turn to the Most High with our whole heart. We must weep before him. Hallelujah. Whenever you think about a championship race, oftentimes the person who won the race, they start crying. But it's not tears of pain, it's tears of joy. And they cry after they win the race. But the scripture here is telling us to cry and mourn as we run the race so that our mourning and our weeping will turn into rejoicing. Hallelujah. So right now is our time to cry out to the Most High, to cry out to him so that he can give us strength to run this race and win so that our pain will be turned into power, so that our sorrow will be turned to success. This is the race of the races. Hallelujah. He says, let the priests, the ministers of the Most High, weep between the porch and the altar, and let them say, spare thy people. Most High, give not thine inheritance to reproach, that the heathen should rule over them. Wherefore should they say among the people, where is their Elohim? Then will the Most High be jealous for his land and pity his people. The Most High will answer and say unto his people, Behold, I will send you corn and wine and oil, and ye shall be satisfied therewith. And listen to his promise, and I will no more make you a reproach among the heathen. That means the heathen will no longer dominate us in this race of the races. Hallelujah. We are like Adam that rules over the beast. We have dominion over these beasts. We have dominion over these other nations. We are the dominant. They are the subservient in this race of the races. Hallelujah. But in order for us to do that as a people, we must first do that individually. It starts with us running our own race individually. Each man must work out his own salvation. We must work out our own salvation. Just like in track and field, it's just you out there running. Can't nobody run for you. Hallelujah. As it says in Galatians chapter 6, verse 4 through 5, but let every man prove his own work, and then shall he have rejoicing in himself alone and not in another. For every man shall bear his own burden. So it starts with us as individuals. How we want our people to be as a whole, we must first be like that individually to be the example. Instead of us complaining and whining and murmuring about how much our people don't get it, how about you show everybody else how much you get it first? How about you show us your fruit and your example first? So we must be winners in our own race first. We must set our own homes in order first. Hallelujah. Check this out, though. Psalm 119, verse 32. It says, I will run the way of thy commandments when thou shalt enlarge my heart. Think about how David worded this. He says, I will run. He didn't say I will walk or I will crawl. He said, I will run the way of thy commandments when thou shalt enlarge my heart. And whenever you take a look at the word run in the Hebrew, it is spelled roots, roots. The word run in Hebrew is roots. So in other words, in order for us to be this be able to run this race of the races, we must know our roots. We must know our heritage. Man, know thyself. You must know that you are a son and a daughter of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It starts with you knowing your roots. And David said, I will run the way of thy commandments. Then it starts with you knowing the laws and commands and keeping them. Ecclesiastes chapter 12. This is the whole duty of man, to fear the Most High and to keep his commandments. Hallelujah. Then what do we do after that? We repent. We be baptized. These are the things that we do in order to run this race of the races. Then what do we do after that? Then we do business and occupy until the Messiah comes. We start ministries. We launch businesses. We do the work of the evangelist. We visit the orphan, the widow, the fatherless, the prisoner. We put forth our funds and our resources into building up the kingdom. We acquire land. We homeschool our children. We fellowship at each other's homes. We form bonds and friendships and loyal, lasting relationships with other brothers and sisters of like mind. That's the blueprint. That's the game plan. And we grow from that. Little by little, decision by decision, thought by thought. 
accomplishment after accomplishment. We run this race of the races and we do it to win. Hallelujah. Listen to what it says in Testament of Judah, chapter 25. It says, and there shall be one people of the most high and one tongue. Ain't this beautiful? Now we started with exposing the fallacy and the lie of the doctrine of we are all one race. We are all the human race. And we are ending it with speaking the truth from the testament of Judah about how the most high is going to make us one people again. And that one people will be the supremacy of the Hebrews and those of other nations who cling to the Hebrews and the Messiah as servants. That's the one people, not this uh, wickedness. They talking about we all one human race and then having people caught up in bestiality and homosexuality, the transhumanism agenda. That's their version of one human race. Now we're going to the scripture version of the one people and the one tongue. Testament of Judah 25. And there shall be one people of the most high and one tongue. And there shall no more be a spirit of deceit of liar, For he shall be cast into the fire forever. And they who have died in grief shall arise in joy. And they who have lived in poverty for the most high and they who have been in want shall be filled and they who have been weak shall be made strong and they who have been put to death for the most high sake shall awaken in life and the hearts of Jacob shall run in joyfulness and the eagles of Israel shall fly in gladness Isaiah chapter 40 verse 29 through 31 he giveth power to the faint and to them that have no might he increaseth strength even the youths shall faint and be weary and the young men shall utterly fall but they that wait upon the Most High shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Let's go on and let's win this race of the races. Hallelujah. All praise. I pray that that discussion has been impactful to somebody out there. Before I go, I want to make brothers and sisters aware of some of the works of the ministry, some projects that we have released. One great project that we have done is the 613 Laws of Torah audiobook. This is a five hour long audiobook narrated by myself. It contains all 613 laws and commands of Torah. It's narrated from the King James Version of Scripture. We don't use any of the pagan names. In the audiobook, there's no other extra commentary or distractions. It's strictly the laws and commands narrated from the King James Version, all 613 laws. In the audio book, I'll also give you the chapter and verse where each law is found so that you can go into the scripture and study the laws for yourself as you listen to the audio book. We put this project together because we live in a time where people are constantly on the go and on the move. We live in a time of advanced technology. The scripture says that faith comes by hearing. So we put the laws and commands in audio book form so that brothers and sisters can listen to the laws and commands while you're on the go. You can download the audio book to your tablet, your uh, phone, your laptop, your desktop. You can listen to the laws and commands while you're riding in the car, while you're at work, while you're in the gym working out, while you're cooking in the kitchen, while you're going to sleep at night. You can have the laws and commands playing in your ear. For we are commanded in Joshua chapter 1, verse 7 and 8 to meditate on the laws and commands day and night and obey them. And then whenever we do that, we will prosper and have good success. So meditating on the laws and commands every day and every night, teaching these laws and commands to our children, that's how we prosper and have good success. That's why we have put the laws and commands in audio book form so brothers and sisters can download it and listen to the laws and commands to become empowered. I will put the link in the description box underneath this video on how you can invest in that project, the 613 Laws of Torah audio book narrated by myself. Once again, it's a five hour long audio book with all 613 laws and commands of Torah. Hallelujah. Because the laws and commands of Torah, that is the universal law. That is the supreme constitution of all those who worship in spirit and in truth. That is our code of conduct. Hallelujah. Another project we've done is the Words of the Messiah audiobook. This is a four hour long audiobook that is also narrated by myself. It is also narrated from the King James Version. We don't use any of the pagan names. This audio book contains the parables, wise sayings, and words of the Messiah. 
that are recorded in scripture from the books of Matthew to the book of John. We put together this audio book because the scripture says that the Messiah is the Torah in the flesh. He is the word made flesh. He never broke his father's law. So by meditating on his words, we follow in his footsteps. So we put together an audio book with the words of the Messiah strictly. All his words recorded in scripture from the King James Version. I will also put the link in the description box underneath this video on how you can invest in that project, the Words of the Messiah audiobook. Another project that we have done is the Words of the Father audiobook. This is a 14-hour long audiobook, also narrated by myself. It contains the words of the Father out of his own mouth, recorded in Scripture, all the way from Genesis, where he said, let there be light, all the way to the New Testament, where he looked at the Messiah after he was baptized, and he said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. So we put together an audio book with nothing but the words of the father, King James Version. And we did that because the scripture says that man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of the father. So we've literally put together a 14 hour long audio book with only the words of the father. Hallelujah. I will also put a link in the description box underneath this video on how you can invest in that project, the Words of the Father audiobook. Something else we have done is the Hebrews for Excellence and Exodus movement. This was launched in January of this year. The goal of that movement is to fulfill what's written in the scripture where it says that this truth must be spread to all four corners of the earth because our people, the children of Israel, have been dispersed to all four corners of the earth. So with the Hebrews for Excellence in Exodus campaign, what we're doing is traveling from city to city all over the United States and all over the world to preach, teach, baptize, minister to the orphan, the widow, the fatherless, go to the nursing homes, the prisons, the jails, to pray, to lay hands on the sick, to cast out devils, to do the work of the Most High, to do the work of the Messiah and the disciples. We've already, since launching in January, we've been as far west in the United States as San Diego, California, to as far east as Jamestown, Virginia. We have literally been to both coasts of the United States already and many places in the Midwest. You can see the footage on my channel. Whenever we go to these cities, we baptize, we preach, we teach. We have meetings with brothers and sisters to discuss launching home fellowships, home businesses, doing homeschooling. We talk about all these things whenever we connect with our brothers and sisters so that we can become that people that is truly set apart, truly self-sustained, truly self-defended. With the Hebrews for Excellence and Exodus Movement, we are also acquiring land. That land is going to be used for Torah-based communities, for us to grow our own food, herd our own cattle, have home businesses, do homeschooling, and have home fellowship on the land. Hallelujah. More information about that will be to come. For those who are interested in supporting the Hebrews for Excellence in Exodus campaign, you can reach out to me in my email. I'll put my email in the description box underneath this video. For those who are interested in donating monetarily, you can also check out the link in the description box for the Hebrews for Excellence in Exodus campaign fund for those who want to donate monies and support. Other than that, I thank y'all just for supporting by listening to these videos, sharing these videos. Let's continue to endure till the end on this race of the races. Let's continue to endure to the end with Hebrew excellence. The marathon continues. Shalom. Shabbat shalom. All praise to the ancient of days. All esteem to the most high Elohim. This is your brother El. And I have an honored guest with me today. I have brother Patrick from Yes Ministries that has taken the time. All right. Oh, that was really good. So everybody, thank you for being here. It was fun in the comment section today. <laughs> it was actually kind of fun. Um, yeah, I heard that laughing. Some people have pointed out they heard laughing. That, that, that was not from me. So I think that was on Brother L's side. But we'll definitely come together and do this again real soon, y'all. And wherever you are, please have a wonderful, wonderful day. Shalom, family.